Good morning, family. How are y'all doing this morning? Man, I'm excited to have you back here with us this week. It's a great time for us to be together in fellowship. I'm super excited. Listen, we have been slacking on our sharing. Oh, I'm going to say it. I'm going to say it. I'm going to say it. We have been slacking on our sharing. I need you to like, comment, and share. And after you share, then do your watch party. I know some of you have been doing watch parties from right here on the Forward Life page, and that's great, and I appreciate it. But I need you to share it and then do a watch party because that leaves the uh, uh, message up on your screen for people to go back and look at it as they go through their timeline on your screen. Look. I also need you to continue to take a screenshot and share this message to your Insta story as well as your Facebook story. Help us get the message out about what Forward Life Church is doing and what we're preaching and what we're sharing. I'm super excited to have you and I don't want to abuse you in terms of uh, getting you to do things that you may not be comfortable with and that's fine but if you are comfortable with sharing this information to your story please do so it just helps us to get the message out all right again i'm excited to have you back this week and can you believe we have come six weeks in our journey together as we engage the series Soul Sagas. And this is the finale of the Soul Saga series. So if you've attended every week, hey, I thank you. I congratulate you for at least listening to what this old preacher has to say about issues that we're facing in this particular dispensation of time that we're in. If this is your first time hearing this series if this is the first message that you're going to hear in this series i encourage you to go back and listen to all of the soul saga messages beginning with the first one all the way up to this point so here we are i'm excited we're going to end this thing but i'm going to end this with a very very compelling thought that i received in prayer if you will turn with me to Luke's gospel, chapter five, verses 36 through 39, Luke's gospel, chapter five, verses 36 through 39. And I'm reading from the new King James standard of the Bible. It says here, then meaning Jesus, then he spoke a parable to them. No one puts a piece from a new garment on an old one. Otherwise, the new makes a tear and also the piece that was taken out of the new does not match the old. Verse 37 says, and no one puts new wine into old wine skins or else the new wine will burst the old wine skins and be spilled and the wineskins will be ruined. But new wine must be put into new wineskins, and both are preserved. Verse 39. And no one having drunk old wine immediately desires new. For he says, the old is better. I want to take my thought from a portion of verse 37 where it says, and no one puts new wine into old wine skins. No one puts new wine into old wine skins. And no one puts new wine into old wine skins. I want to speak from the subject of Skin deep. Skin deep. You know, as I meditated on what the final soul saga would be, it occurred to me that I have failed to touch on one critical entity. I've shared thoughts with you on government policy. 
I've shared my thoughts with you about the color line and how it has impacted things socially, economically, and educationally. I've shared with you my thoughts regarding the history of our country. I've shared with you my thoughts about how the Bible has been misused to corroborate a particular agenda. I've shared with you my thoughts regarding improper policing, how it has led to distrust between law enforcement and black and brown communities. I've even shared with you my thoughts about our prison system and how I firmly believe not every prisoner is a long-term problem and every prisoner is not a failure. However, in all of my sharing, the one sacred cow I have failed to touch during this Soul Saga series is the church. The church is an important entity of discussion around the soul. Mainly because it's widely known that the most segregated hour of the week takes place on Sundays. Sundays are the days where divisiveness is stealthily tolerated amongst ethnic groups. We're divided over what style of music to play. We're divided over what style of preaching to declare. We're divided over how we should dress. Do we dress up or do we dress down? We're divided over how long service times should be. But the one thing I believe we're most divided over is the truth about inequality. It seems that some in innocent naivete truly believe that all things are considered equal in the church. Part of the reason why I felt led to preach this series is because of the church's poor response to our differences as a whole. We tend to believe that if we don't address certain things, they will eventually go away. But the truth of the matter is, they never go away. It always resurfaces in places like Minneapolis, Minnesota, Brunswick, Georgia, Louisville, Kentucky, and Aurora, Colorado. These are places where division and biases overtly exist and have shown up in many different ways and many different scenarios. However, these same divisions exist, dare I say, covertly in the church. It's been that way since the church's inception, and I'll prove it to you. One day, two of my favorite apostles got into it over covert bias. Paul was sent to plant a church at Antioch that was predominantly Gentile. When word got back to the church in Jerusalem about the Gentiles receiving the faith, Peter was sent to the church to verify it. When Peter got there, he verified the Gentiles being faithful to Jesus Christ. Peter hung out with the Gentiles. Peter ate with the Gentiles. Peter did life with the Gentiles. However, once certain Jews came to Antioch from Jerusalem, Peter started acting funny with the Gentile. 
Gentiles. He stopped eating with the Gentiles. He stopped hanging at their houses and started distancing himself from the Gentiles. And this caused a lot of the Jews, including Barnabas, who helped Paul plant the church to ostracize the Gentiles. To save the integrity of the grace message, Paul confronted Peter on his hypocrisy. He was like, Peter, you were just kicking it like you were a Gentile before your boys came from Jerusalem. If you could kick it with them, why are you expecting them to conform to traditional Judaistic custom? You see, what we need in the church today are people who understand that no one has any more of an advantage over someone else based on cultural biases. <laughs> Jesus is the great equalizer who tore down the walls of partition we love to hide behind. There's no advantage in me treating you like you're inferior, and there's no advantage in you treating me like I'm inferior. There's no advantage in us turning up our noses at one another. I need you. You need me. We're all a part of God's body. Oh, my God. Why should we compete with one another? Why should we turn our back on one another? Why should we mistreat one another? Why should we alienate one another? Why should we distance ourselves from one another when we can simply collaborate and have a whole body of believers from various parts of the world, various parts of the country, various experiences, various worldviews, various uh, uh, ideology or uh, idioms of thought or what have you, to come together, it'll make the body of Christ much better. And so what I've discovered is what we need is more balance in the church. <laughs> Here it is. I came across a very interesting read the other day, and I just want to share it with you. It was an article addressing how multiracial churches are not really truly bridging the racial divide. Did you hear what I said? I said it was about multiracial churches not really bridging the racial divide. Now, before I go further, let me preface what I'm about to say. A white male sociologist research was used to determine certain things. Did you hear me? A white male sociologist research was used to determine certain things. And I said that that way so that you can understand the importance of what I'm about to say. This didn't come from Rico Holland. This didn't come from a black sociologist. This came from a white male sociologist. It didn't even come from a white female sociologist. It came from a white male sociologist. Through his research, he determined that by thinking racial prejudice is an individual issue as opposed to a societal one, evangelicals perpetuate racial division. Did you hear what I said? Oh my God. By thinking racial justice is an individual issue as opposed to a societal one, evangelicals perpetuate racial division. In other words, I'm not prejudiced, so I'm fine. However, the flaw in that way of thinking leads to moments where a person who thinks this way fails to address the prejudices they see in other people. I'm glad you're not prejudiced, but can you please address the prejudices you see in the folk that look like you? Ooh! 
that was good right there. That was worth the admission to this message. Can you please address the prejudices in the people who look like you? I applaud that you're not prejudiced. I applaud that you're not racist. I applaud that you got friends of other ethnic groups. But can you please step to the podium and address the people who look like you who hold racial prejudice? Think about it this way. What if Paul would have taken that stance? I'm not prejudiced without addressing the prejudice in Peter. Peter's behavior, which had already started to metastasize, would have killed the church at Antioch with the cancer of racism. Let me tell y'all a little secret. Until white people confront white people. Until black people confront black people, until Hispanic people confront Hispanic people, until Asian people confront Asian people, racial bias will continue. You heard it here first. <laughs> Had a Gentile confronted Peter, it would have made a much greater difference because Paul Oh, my God, it would have made not much great of a difference because Paul was the one who confronted Peter. A Jew himself confronted Peter. It carried much more weight than just a little bit here and there. See, had a Gentile went to Peter and said, Peter, uh, you was just eating um, smothered pork chops with us. Uh, you want some collard greens? Uh, uh, you want some sweet potatoes? Uh, uh, had, had a Gentile gone to Peter with that, it wouldn't have had that much of an effect. But because a Jew just like Peter confronted Peter's racial bias, it had a little something extra on it. And I'm here to tell you, that there comes a point where we have to confront those who look like us, those who have our same background, those who have our same socioeconomic status, so that we can get over a lot of the prejudices that we have within one another. And I'm here to tell you that black people can be just as prejudiced, Mexican people can be just as prejudiced, Asian people can be just as prejudiced, white people can be just as prejudiced as any other ethnic group. Another roadblock revealed in this article is how you can be multiracial but not truly multicultural in the church. You can be welcoming to all people. Watch this. As long as they do church your way. Hmm, my God. In other words, the question becomes, do you celebrate everyone's heritage or are you just dogmatic about preserving your own? Did you hear what I said? Did, do you celebrate everyone's heritage or are you dogmatic about preserving your own? We only do this kind of music. We only celebrate these kinds of things. And if you're willing uh, to, if you're unwilling to acknowledge the fact that we are a multicultural nation, then multi-ethnic church probably isn't for you. Another roadblock the article revealed is that congregants of color are slightly more receptive than white congregants. Oh, I said it. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm going to get myself in some trouble today, but I got to deal with it. Congregants of color are slightly more receptive than white congregants. One black lady was interviewed for the article, and she said, that she joined a church that was in the process of integrating. 
At first, people would just stare at her and look at her and act surprised that she was even there at their church. It wasn't until, watch this, she broke the ice by greeting and hugging that they felt more comfortable with her. Mm. Can I tell you what one of my soul wounds is? Why do I always have to make you feel comfortable before you embrace me? Hear me. Oh, it's a shame that sometimes black folk have to always make white people feel comfortable before they'll embrace them. Listen, I'm the new person on the block. I'm the new person in the church. I'm the new person trying to be a part of the local body of Christ and the local family why don't you greet me with open arms why is it that I always have to make you feel comfortable before you accept me oh my God here's another issue that came up in the article one black pastor who was interviewed for the article said for the black Pastor, integrated churches are tough things. He said, integrated churches are tough things. What he means by this statement is, when you see integrated churches, they're usually led by Caucasian Pastors. This pastor believes that it's difficult for many whites to look at a black leader as an authority figure. Hmm, I don't know. My God, I'm just saying what the man said. Oh, my God. Now, I know there are some who are doing it. But let's be clear here. Those leaders are very rare. Leaders like the great Mike Todd and some of the other leaders who are leading multi-racial and multi-ethnic and multicultural congregations are rare. And so what I had to do is I had to free myself. I freed myself from the burden of trying to appeal to everybody. Did you hear what I said? I'm talking about Rico Holland. Forward Life Church is open to everybody, but I'm freeing myself from the burden of trying to appeal to everybody. Can I tell some people something and still be their friend? If you love my ministry, but can't see me as, see me as your pastor, I'm cool with that. I'm going to say it again. If you love my ministry, but you can't see me as your pastor, I'm cool with that. But here's the caveat. Don't expect me to minimalize who I am to accommodate your spiritual needs as they arise. Here it is. I'm not going to minimalize myself. If you need a wedding officiated, I'm sending you an invoice. If you need a funeral officiated, I'm sending you an invoice. If you need spiritual guidance and spiritual counseling, I'm sending you an invoice. Why? Because if you think that it's okay for you to go and just use me when it's your time to use me because you like my ministry but you won't support my ministry I'm sending you an invoice because let me tell you something uh, you think pastor so and so from the multi-site mega church is going to do, do you a favor then let's see how that work out for you if you want me to do things for you but you don't want me to, to be your leader if you don't want me to be your pastor I'm okay with that but an invoice is coming just give me your mode of delivery and I'll get it to you because I'm sick and tired of people who want to use what's on my life but can't see themselves supporting it. Are you hearing what I'm saying? You, If you don't think that's right, that's fine. But let me tell you what I know isn't right. It's not right for you to expect me to take away from my flock to do spiritual favors for you. You heard it here first. 
That's what I should have called that segment of the message. You heard it here first, baby. Ah, you can go back and rewind it. You can fast forward it. You can look at it as many ways as you want to. But you are not going to put a demand on this anointing and not so into it. I'm not taking away from the people who call me their pastor. I'll do whatever I can to serve them faithfully and won't charge them a dime. But an outsider? Oh, you're going to get that invoice. <laughs> Let me move on. Another roadblock the article presented is the lack of diversity in key positions of churches. Watch this. Just because you have multiracial congregants doesn't make you a multi cultural church mm, my god just because you have multiracial congregants doesn't make you a multiracial or multicultural church you want to know what makes you multiracial and multi uh, uh, cultural if you don't have balance on your paid staff and balance in your key leadership positions you're still operating under white superiority. Did you hear what I said? If you don't have balance on your paid staff and balance in your key leadership positions, you're still operating under white superiority. It's one thing for you to accept me, but it's another matter for you to understand what it's like to be me. Mm, I'm going to say that again. It's one thing for you to accept me, but it's another matter for you to understand what it's like to be me. If you don't have someone in your ear who represents me, you will not be able to fully address my needs and concerns. I believe this is what has happened in these situations where white pastors have misspoke about racial issues. They, they tried to speak on something that they didn't have proper perspective for. And this tells me one of two things. Either they don't have enough people of color on their staff or they don't value their opinions if they do. Woo! I'm just telling you straight up that either they don't have enough people of color on their staff who's in their ear telling them, hey, listen, I think you might want to say it this way instead of that way because, you know, if you understand the history and if you understand this and if you understand that, then you won't say it the way that you're saying it. You will say it a different way. But if they do have enough people of color on their staff, they must not value their opinion. And my question is, which one is it? The issue at hand in Luke's gospel, chapter 5, verses 36 through 39, is a matter of differences. Some incumbent draconian provocateurs have a problem with these newcomers, a.k.a. Jesus' disciples. They want to know why are they treated differently? What, what makes them so special? What, what makes them so uh, unique that they're allowed to be different? Why don't they have to adhere to the same fasting schedule as the Pharisees and John the Baptist's disciples? What I find interesting here is the text never identifies who these provocateurs are. We know that Jesus has been questioned earlier in the chapter by Pharisees, scribes, and lawgivers. 
we really pay attention to the third person prose of the question, it will lead us to believe that it's, it, that it's neither John's disciples nor the Pharisees asking the question. So then we can deduce that it must be the scribes attempting to provoke Jesus. And let me help you understand in biblical culture what a scribe was. A scribe was a writer who wrote professionally. They would interpret the law, but they also kind of served as the local news reporters in the time. So by asking Jesus this question, they are trying to spin a story to stain his ministry. Did you hear what I said? By them asking Jesus this question about his disciples, they are trying to spin a story to stain Jesus's ministry. But what I find fascinating is in posing this question uh, about Jesus' disciples' lack of discipline, they never mentioned themselves in the same light as the thing they're criticizing in someone else. <laughs> Did you hear what I said? Mm? In posing this question to Jesus about his disciples and their discipline, they never mentioned themselves in the same light as the thing they're criticizing in someone else. They're criticizing someone else over a standard that they're not even trying to reach themselves. Can I park here just just to say that I'm sick and tired of people who ain't doing nothing but overly criticizing other people who are trying to do something. Oh God, I'm tired of folk that got a whole lot to say but can't seem to find anything to do. Oh my God, how can you criticize someone else for at least attempting to be different while you're okay with being the same? You hypocrite you every time you look at someone else and try to throw shade on them you need to check your own fruit I saw a meme a few weeks ago and it really really resonated with me it says don't pay attention to the shade you receive from fruitless trees don't pay attention to the shade you receive from fruitless trees and there's a whole lot of fruitless people that have a lot to say about the season that you're in. Mm -hmm. They ain't doing nothing. They ain't trying to create nothing. They ain't trying to get anything off the ground. They ain't trying to make anything happen. But they got a whole lot to say about the season that you're in. But I'm here to prophesy out to somebody that you shall be like the tree that is planted by the water who will bear fruit in your season. I'm here to tell you that it's your season to bear fruit. Keep being different. Keep challenging the status quo. Keep going after something different. Keep raising the envelope. Keep pushing to new levels. Keep going deeper. Keep going higher. Let them talk about you. Let them laugh at you. Let them mock you. Let them scorn you. Just keep on bearing fruit. <laughs> they have come to Jesus based on a grievance they have over what someone else is doing. And this doesn't even concern them, but Jesus is gracious enough to address their inquiry. The first thing he did was attempt to answer their question with a question of his own. Jesus said, can you make the friends of the bridegroom fast while the bridegroom is with them? They must have had a puzzled look on their faces because there's no response to that. 
So Jesus attempted to further explain. He said, but the days will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them. Then they will fast in those days. There still wasn't a response to Jesus. So Jesus changed the object of his explanation. He switched to a topic that we all can relate to. And, and whether we will admit it or not, whether we will embrace it or not, whether we will come clean about it or not, all of us have had issues with skin. <laughs> All of us have had issues with skin. Whether it's being comfortable in our skin, whether it's comparing our skin, or whether it's judging each other's skin, we can all relate to skin issues. It's in a roundabout way, Jesus lays out how we must go below the skin to get to the real quality of what makes us different. But before he gets to that, he points out how the overhaul of what's damaged matters. He says, watch this, this is interesting. No one puts a piece from a new garment on an old one. Otherwise, the new makes a tear. And also, the piece that was taken out of the new does not match the old. Woo, this is some deep stuff, man. If you could really catch this, you got to get this. This is a part of the big picture that I'm trying to paint here. Here it is. Jesus is stating that when it comes down with dealing with an existing problem, wait for it, patchwork won't do. <laughs> Man, I wish I could preach this. I wish I wish I had somebody who would holler back at me. Oh, my God. In those comments and say patchwork won't do patchwork won't get it done. In other words, you have to understand that in order to deal with the problem, you've got to deal with the problem as a whole. You can't pick and choose which spots to address. Did you hear what I said? You can't pick and choose which spots to address. Can I tell you that what we've seen regarding inequality and racial division and the attempts to fix the problem in the church has just been patchwork. <laughs> Here it is. Uh, we need more color in the choir. Put a few people in the choir. Uh, uh, we need more color on the usher board. Put a few people in the usher board. Uh, uh, we need more color in our greeters. Uh, uh, put a few people on the greeting team. Uh, uh, we need more color on stage. Put a few people in the band. Now we're diverse. No, you're not diverse. This thing is much deeper than patchwork. Patchwork will never solve big problems. <laughs> Either we're going to deal with the entire thing or we're going to patch up holes here and there. But Jesus explicitly states that forcing a uh, focusing on holes and not dealing with the entire thing only leads to more damage. But then the question becomes, more damage to who? Here it is. If something already has holes and your only solution is to cover it up, watch this. Where are you getting 
the patches from. <laughs> One of the biggest complaints that I've seen uh, with a lot of black leaders is, is that in order to diversify white churches, white leaders have taken people from their congregations and gifted people that they need and added them to their staff because they can pay them more. And I understand getting paid, man. I ain't hating on you for getting your money, but you have to understand that when you take from one cloth to patch up the holes in another cloth, then you've left a void in the cloth that you've taken away from. You're going to have to take fabric from another whole pattern to cover up what's damaged somewhere else. Mm. And here's why Jesus is saying patchwork doesn't work. In order to fix what's old and torn, you have to cut a piece from what's new and whole. Did you hear what I said? In order to fix what's old and torn, you would have to cut a patch from what's new and whole. And it's better to throw the old thing out and keep the new thing whole. What we need is to embrace something new and quit attempting to repair what's worn with patchwork. The other problem Jesus has with patchwork is the pattern of the new doesn't fit the old. <laughs> Did you hear what I said? The pattern of the new doesn't fit the old. And if we're going to resolve our differences, we're going to have to recognize patterns. I'm going to say that again because I don't think y'all got it. If we're going to resolve our differences, we're going to have to recognize patterns. And what makes a pattern a pattern is the intricate weaving, watch this, of different colors. <laughs> Listen, I got news for somebody. People who claim to not see colors are incapable of appreciating patterns. Did you hear what I said? People who claim not to see colors are incapable of appreciating patterns. And God is into patterns. He's not into a black church. He's not into a white church. He's not into a brown church. He's not into a yellow church. He's into the church. Oh my God. A church that doesn't have a spot or wrinkle, but it's woven with patterns. And solid colors are okay, but sometimes boring. <laughs> And what we need to do is we need to blend our colors so that we can have great patterns. And what's missing from our lives is that we're not able to see the beauty of people coming together. The beauty of people being able to blend together. The beauty of people being able to uh, uh, integrate together from different backgrounds and different colors and, and different styles and, and different experiences. Don't just try to protect your old, worn out thing by cutting out a patch from something new and whole to repair what's broken in a system that's not working. Let me get out of here because I'm boring y'all to death. Y'all don't like this message. If you want to send an email, uh, I ain't going to give you my email address. Anyway, Jesus made an excellent point about the patchwork. And for me, he could have left things at that and I would have been fine. But he chose to go skin deep. 
what Jesus used next absolutely lifted the lid off of the whole entire response to their question. He says, and no one puts new wine into old wine skins or else the new wine will burst the skins and be spilled and the skins, wine skins, will be ruined. <laughs> and at first I wondered, why would Jesus go to talk about wine? I mean, I understand the first miracle he worked was turning water into wine. What is Jesus's affinity with wine? But then it hit me. Wine is the most suitable comparison to use in this context. Watch this. It's not a solid. It's a liquid. That's a composite. Did you hear what I said? Wine is not a solid. It's a liquid that's a composite. Wine is the result of what happens when grapes and yeast are allowed to work out their complex reactions to one another. Mm -hmm. Man, I feel like preaching then. Oh, wine is the result of what happens when grapes and yeast are allowed to work out their complex reaction to one another. This means that fluidity and flexibility have to be in a place uh, to allow the reaction and give room for wine to grow. And the problem with old wine skins is over time, they lose their ability to be flexible. Mm. Old wine skins become rigid. Uh, old wine skins uh, become all caught up in the old way of doing things. And this is what we see happening in the church. We're too rigid and intolerable of the complex reaction to one another's issues. And what Jesus is saying is, we've got to go skin deep because there's a new wine that's coming that must be allowed to ferment. It must be allowed to work through its complexities. It must be allowed to have a certain reaction without judgment. It must be allowed to expand without having to accommodate the fragility of old systems. And I'm here to tell the church that we must have these tough conversations about race. We need to put away our fragility and get thicker skin that's able to accommodate the wine, the new wine of the gospel so that we can grow. Can I tell you, my white counterparts, can I tell you something and still be your friend? If you're going to minister to people of color, you're going to have to say ouch every now and then. Did you hear what I said? You're not going to be able to effectively reach us if you prioritize your fragility over truth. Did you hear that? You're not going to be able to effectively reach people who look like me if you prioritize your fragility over truth. Can I tell my black and brown contemporary something and still be your friend? We can be just as fragile as any other people group. We need to stop assuming that every white person is prejudiced. We need to start holding our own selves accountable and we need to start finding ways to diversify our contacts and connections. 
Our limited worldview is due to our own fragility. And it's fragile at best. And what Jesus is trying to get them to understand is that there is a new harvest of souls that his gospel is able to produce. His gospel is able to pull. His gospel is able to attract. But your old way of thinking, your old approach to life, your old perspective, your old way of doing things is not going to be capable of holding this new wine. Because when wine begins to ferment, it starts to expand. It has to have room to grow. And what new wine skins will do is allow for the flexibility, whereas old wine skins are worn out and they can't handle the expansion of new wine, which causes the wine to leak out. And let me close with this because I'm boring y'all to death. You know, I got to say that every now and then just to wake y'all up. What Jesus said to close out his response to their question made all the sense in the world to me. In verse 39, he says, and no one having drunk old wine immediately desired new for he says the old is better and I will ask America who is the old wine better for certainly not people of color the old ways of thinking the old ways of life holding on to the things of yesteryear will never bring about change in our country. We've come a long way and I urge America to allow this new wine to continue to ferment. It may cause some complex reactions between people groups. It may cause some complex reaction between uh, ideologies or, 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 or ways of thinking and complex reactions between experiences in our country, but it's the same country. It's no more your country than my country. It's our country. And we got to learn to allow the complex reaction of people groups to happen so that the wine can come into its full maturity. But if our skin is not thick enough, if our skin is not tough enough, if our skin is not flexible enough, we won't be able to handle the transition of new wine. I just want to help somebody to understand that everything that I've shared in this Soul Saga series has been spoken from my heart. I haven't said anything out of, out of malice. If I've offended anyone, forgive me. Charge it to my head and not my heart. But I believe that truth has been spoken in all six messages. You see, we have to ask ourselves a question. Are we really for change? Or do we want to hold on to what we're comfortable with? And change is challenging. And change requires tough conversations. And we got to be here for the conversation. Let us pray. Father God, I pray 
that what we've learned over the past six weeks of this series will be taken seriously to heart. That we will reevaluate our approach to people of other ethnic groups. That black people and white people and brown people and yellow people and whatever other color of people that covers the spectrum of humanity that we'll learn to come together, settle our differences, reason with one another, get a greater understanding of one another. Repent in the areas where it's necessary. Get healed, get delivered, and get set free. I come against the spirit of racial prejudice. I come against the spirit of us versus them. I come against the spirit of division. I come against the spirit of exclusion. I come against the spirit of, uh, of insecurity and, and racial disparity. I come against the spirit of greed and avarice. And I ask us, Lord, to help us reevaluate our position on critical issues that have impacted certain people groups come against the spirit of class may we get an understanding that in this time in this season that we're in that we seek your face like never before turn from our wicked ways and allow you to heal our land. We don't look to any particular candidate to heal our land. We don't look to any particular leader to heal our land. We need you to heal our land. In the mighty, magnificent, matchless name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Listen, we got a new series starting next week. I'm super excited about it. I hope you tell people that a new series is coming, but also continue to share with them about this Soul Saga series. Take care. See you next week.